and what kind of a toxicity it is and what are the symptoms we are going to discuss. But uh, uh, broadly speaking, this thorough toxicosis is a condition where it actually, uh, you know, brings around uh, uh, a lot of biochemical changes in the body, certain physical changes in the body, and also, also certain psychological changes in the body. So th this is basically a triad of uh, biochemical change, a physical change, and a psychological change as well. So uh, we're going to talk about all these today. But, uh, you know, uh, before we do that, let's see um, that what is the epidemiology of uh, this disease. Uh, as you can see from the first line that this is about the, uh, about the uh, race related incidence, it is quite uh, equally common in the European and the Asian population and also in the, in the, uh, in the African population. So it is a uniform disease all over the world. But, um, some or the other, the rate of this disease is much lower in the African Americans, and uh, you know this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, thyrotoxicosis can present in uh, various forms. It can be in the form of a uh, diffuse toxic goiter known as Graves' disease, or in the form of a toxic multinodular goiter or a toxic adenoma. So the frequency is slightly different in different types of uh, uh, this. Uh, when we are talking about this Graves autoimmune disease, the male to female ratio is about one to uh, five to ten. Definitely, this thyroid disease is much more common in women as compared to men. But here, when they're talking about uh, the uh, Graves disease or the diffuse thyroid toxicosis, the ratio is about one male to five to ten females. Whereas, when we're talking about toxic multinodular goiter, still it is much more common in the females. But the ratio, you know, uh, shoots down to uh, one male to four females. And this grave ophthal uh, ophthalmopathy is much more common in women. But uh, if you talk about the um, age-related incidence, heterotoxicosis is very less known to occur in children and in the elderly population. The peak incidence is, uh, you know, relatively a younger population or the adult population ranging between 20 to 50 years. But you must remember that thyroid, uh, these toxic adenomas, some or the other, they are present uh, in younger age groups and younger females. And uh, as compared to you talking about a toxic multinodal goiter or diffuse toxic goiter. So this is about the race more common, uh, you know, in the uh, all over the world, lesser in the African Americans. The ratio is uh, more in uh, women as compared to men. And we have talked about the different kinds of um, uh, toxic diseases and how does this ratio differ. And also uh, that uh, this disease is relatively much more common in the adult age group, less common in the uh, children, less common in the older age group. These are the various varieties of, uh, you know, uh, thyrotoxicosis. That is how thyrotoxicosis can present itself. First of all, it is like a diffuse toxic goiter. And then there's a toxic multinodular goiter, toxic adenoma, and then there's thyrotoxicosis due to non-thyroid disorders. That is, the cause is lying somewhere else. Uh, it is not actually related to the thyroid gland itself. We are going to discuss all of them one by one. Uh, first of all, few uh, related uh, pictures, and so that you can get a fair idea that I'm, I'm sure that uh, as medical students, you must have seen uh, a lot of uh, cases of thyroid because it's very common. And uh, when you will be coming into the wards, you'll be seeing a lot of thyroid diseases. And, uh, and obviously, when there's a lot of thyroid patients coming into the OPDs and into the into our wards and a lot of thyroid surgeries are being done, then you will come across a lot of thyroid patients while you are appearing in the fellowship examinations or the final examinations of your MBBS. So it's a very common disease all over the world. So you will find, uh, wherever I went uh, uh, to do my examinations here or abroad in Pakistan, I've always found the thyroid, uh, you know, as a short case or a long case, always there. So uh, it's very important as far as his examinations is also concerned. So we'll first talk about a diffuse toxic goiter. And you can see that uh, uh, the, the uh, goiter will appear diffusely. And uh, unlike the other simple goiters or euthyroid goiters, uh, when you're talking about a diffuse toxic goiter, uh, the, uh, the goiter and the toxicity, they start appearing simultaneously. That is, it's not like that, that the goiter is there for a very long period of time and then it develops a thyrotoxicosis. Actually, they almost start simultaneously. 
and uh, the the gland that uh, actually uh, keeps on growing in size and it is like you know a diffuse enlargement though the, he's a male uh, the picture of a male but it is much more common in the females as compared to the males and you can see that there's a diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland both lobes and isthmus together and uh, all those people who have got diffuse toxic goiter or graves disease usually they will have some kind of other autoimmune disorder going on in the body roughly 50% of patients who have got diffuse toxic goiter will have some kind of other uh, you know um, autoimmune disease disease going on into the body so when we are coming across a patient who has got uh, diffuse toxic goiter male or female we should also look for as a clinician look for signs and symptoms of uh, autoimmune disorders somewhere else in the body as well so you should not limit your evaluation or your history taking only to the thyroid gland so this is very important to remember and understand as well and in most of these circumstances when you are actually coming across this uh, autoimmune thyroid uh, autoimmune uh, diffuse toxic goiter the usual reason is that uh, these people will i'll just write it down for you that these people will have um, uh, um what is known as uh, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibodies in them and these thyroid stimulating receptor antibodies will actually go and uh, uh, they will attach themselves into the thyroid receptor uh, receptor sites tsh receptor sites inside the thyroid gland and because of this continuous stimulus uh, you'll find that the glands they keep on increasing in size and this excessive production of the uh, thyroid hormones as well so remember that these are dependent upon these thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibodies for their for their initiation and and their sustenance and frequently you will also find that uh, dr8 uh, and the hla8 antigens they are also present in these people so this is a good diagnostic clue to have and then other uh, you know a strange kind of uh, second reason for development of diffuse toxic goiter is, is infected uh, there are two uh, bacteria which are quite commonly related to the development of uh, these um, uh, diffuse toxic goiters first is very common in our society and you must be uh, aware of this bacteria and the second uh, which is more viciously related to this is known as uh, let me spell it out for you it's known as yersinia and and then there olectica this is how this spelled so these two um, bacteria the e coli and the uh, yersinia and tetracolytica they also have got uh, these uh, thyroid stimulating receptor site uh, binding sites onto the cell surface and these uh, bacteria will also go on to the thyroid stimulating uh, hormone receptor sites on the thyroid gland and will actually uh, uh, you know uh, start uh, stimulating the thyroid follicles through Uh, to not only hy get a hyperplasia but hypertrophy. So remember that uh, this diffuse toxic goiter can have a bacterial origin as well, and you know that E. coli is very very common in our society. So uh, you should remember this point as well. So this is about uh, this. How does a diffuse toxic goiter develop? And then a uh, few things about a toxic nodular goiter. This is not a diffuse kind of enlargement of the thyroid gland, and this might only develop. in actually uh, one of the lobes in the form of multiple nodules or it forms multiple nodules in both lobes or maybe you know centrally located uh, located nodule so this can occur anywhere and it is in the form of a nodular goiter that is when you actually see this uh, uh, patient clinically just on inspection you will be able to find that the thyroid gland is not diffusely enlarged as the previous uh, you know um, uh, uh, condition it will actually keep on um, uh, increasing in size in the form of nodules and these nodules might only be located to one of the lobe and the other lobe is absolutely normal this these nodules may be in both lobes or they will be centrally located actually uh, what happens is this that uh, you know some of the nodules they become hyperactive and they start uh, producing excessive amount of thyroxine and this excessive amount of thyroxine suppresses the other part of the gland and uh, so there's one mechanism and sometimes there's just a single nodule or two nodules they actually keep on increasing in size because of uh, uh, the stimulus 
and sometimes in uh, diffuse uh, toxic nodular goiter what happens is this that the uh, thyroid tissue which is intervening between the nodules it starts getting increased in size so there are three ways you can have a toxic nodular goiter either the multiple nodules they start becoming uh, you know hypertrophied and uh, they will actually produce more thyroxine or they'll be just one or two central located nodules or they, that might be a reason that the intervening uh, thyroid tissue it actually starts uh, uh, getting uh, hyperplasia and uh, hypertrophy and it will present in the form of multiple nodules all over the gland so this is how a toxic nodular goiter develops but then there's another entity known as toxic adenoma remember these all uh, types or these all varieties will produce uh, toxicity um, i'll just take a, a break to get the feedback uh, um, or I can hear that as well. Okay, so um, I was just taking feedback from Dr. Ozer that that is whether uh, you are able to see uh, the presentation, the slides, and uh, whether you are able to hear me or not. So uh, in a toxic adenoma, the toxic adenoma will uh, develop as a small nodule in a you know normally uh, present thyroid gland, and then it catch, actually keeps on increasing in size, and sometimes the rest of the thyroid body might also be enlarged, but you know. Uh, a single dominant nodule develops and this might keep on increasing in size and present it in the form of uh, a clinically uh, visible and a palpable single nodule into the thyroid gland and it is usually going to produce a lot of thyroxine and uh, this thyroxine is going to suppress the rest of the gland but it will produce a lot of toxicity so usually toxic adenomas are much more toxic as compared to a diffuse toxic goiter or a toxic multinodular goiter and these toxic adenomas are independent of, uh, you know, uh, a thyroid stimulating receptor site. They, they are dependent upon their own excessive RNAs activity in their own, you know, specific follicle, which increases to form a nodule. So remember, the mechanism of development of a toxic adenoma is entirely different from the development of a diffuse toxic goiter or toxic multinodular goiter. There, we are dependent upon the thyroid stimulating receptor thyroid stimulating hormone receptor sites, which actually get some kind of stimulus from outside, from the antibodies or from the bacteria or from something else, and they start hypertrophying. But this is absolutely independent from an external environment or external influence. Toxic adenomas will have their own independent excessive RNAs activity, and this excessive RNAs activity would lead to the uh, hypertrophy of the follicles, and these follicles will become larger in size, they will form adenomas, which initially are just small nodules, but later on they become as, you know, large as you can see in, in these slides as well. So then we have got a toxic adenoma. Few words about the histology of uh, thyrotoxicosis. Uh, on, on the um, uh, left side of the screen, you can see that uh, uh, this is a normal thyroid uh, histology. You can see that the follicles are lined by uh, cells and there's a lot of uh, you know um, colloid inside the follicles this is relatively a normal gland which is showing a normal activity and there are certain follicles which will be more active and uh, they will actually have lesser amount of colloid material in them and this is a normal working uh, you know uh, thyroid. but if you just switch on to the opposite side this is uh, the picture of a thyroid gland which is actually working very aggressively. You can see that uh, the cells are no more, they are just cuboidal cells, they are thrown into, you know, columnar cells and they keep on increasing in size, just, and they, they, it looks like they, they, they form small papillas inside the follicles. And you can see that the amount of the, uh, of the uh, colloid material, it actually reduces, and you can see vacuoles appearing. These white lines are actually vacuoles, and you can see multiple vacuoles all over the body. This means that this thyroid follicle is very, very uh, active and it's working aggressively. And uh, this is this, this is a lazy thyroid gland, but this is a very, very active thyroid gland where the cells become uh, columnar instead of cuboidal. They're thrown into papillary projections, and there's lesser amount of colloid material because most of the um, most of the thyroxine is being excreted outside through the endocrine system into our circulation. So uh, the histological difference is also remarkable. Let's see what happens in actually thyrotoxicosis. I've taken this picture from a book. Uh, 
actually, uh, you know, uh, thyroxine is a catalyst at the neuromuscular junction. So if, if you, this is a, how a neuromuscular junction look like. Uh, you will have an axon and the inherited dendrites, and there's a synaptic uh, junction between the nerve and the muscle. And, and you can see that uh, the acetylcholine is actually in the form of small, um, you know, follicles. It is preserved in the endings of the of the axons, and these keep on actually uh, getting released into this uh, neuromuscular junction. And on the muscle, there are acetylcholine receptors, and when this acetylcholine is released you know, the, uh, the nerve conduction starts and the, um, the nerve signal is given from the nerve to the muscle and the muscles they start working. This is how normally um, our body is going to work. It's not only true for a neuromuscular junction, it's true for a, from a nerve to a nerve junction. So neuroneuronal junctions and neuromuscular junctions both. So uh, what thyroxine does is, thyroxine is a catalyst in this neuromuscular junction. In the absence of thyroxine, acetylcholine is neither released effectively into this neuromuscular junction synapse, or neither it is utilized effectively. Neither it is allowed to bind to the ACH receptor. So it is a three-pronged action. The thyroxine acts as a stimulus for the release of acetylcholine. It acts as an activator for the acetylcholine, and it also acts as a helping force, as a catalyst, for the acetylcholine to bind the acetylcholine receptors. So you can very well imagine that if thyroxine is not there in the neuromuscular junction, the transmission of nerve signals from the nerves to the muscles or from the nerves to the nerves is going to be slowed down. So that is the reason that in all cases of hypothyroidism, every activity of the body is slowed down. The patient is lethargic, the patient is fatigued, the BMR is very low, uh, you know, there's loss of appetite. So every activity of the body is actually reduced. So lack of thyroxine slows down your body. But the reverse happens when and there's more thyroxine. You know, a certain level of thyroxine is good for the body. It is good for you to actually, you know, do your routine daily activities. It is good for you to actually do your learning processes, to concentrate, to remember, to reproduce, and do every activity of your body. So you can very well imagine that thyroxine is very, very helpful uh, for, because, uh, you know, uh, while working in UK and USA, I, I came to know that uh, any child who is going to the school, uh, it is by law mandatory that the child is going to get his or her thyroid hormones assessed done. Because sometimes if the, if the, uh, the thyroid hormones are low, uh, the child will have a definite deficiency in learning capabilities, not only learning capabilities, but sports activities as well. So these child, these children would not be able to participate fully. So it's very important to know uh, that these children are absolutely proficient in their thyroxine levels so that there is no hamper in their learning capabilities. Uh, so, but a good, uh, a certain amount of thyroxine is good for the body and a slightly elevated thyroxine might also be a bit more, you know, uh, you know, um, helpful for people. But if it ex exceeds a certain level, this thyroxine is not good for the body because this is going to then enhance every possible function of your body, starting from your head right up to the toe. Let's see certain, uh, I'm sure that you are going to talk in detail about thyroxicosis in your medical lectures, but I'll just give you uh, certain very uh, pertinent symptoms which you have to deal with because, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, thyroxine in the neuron neuronal junctions. So the synaptic transmission is uh, very, very um, uh, rapid. So these people will have a lot of, disturb, you know, a lot of uh, uh, disturbance in the sleep. Because uh, when you wake, wake up in the morning, uh, that is the reason that you will always try to get uh, an early morning T3, T4, TSH test done. Because in the morning, your T3, T4 levels are higher and TSH levels are lower normally and in the evenings the t3 and t4 automatically drops down because your activity are supposed to slow down and if you have got excessive amount of thyroxine in your body uh, obviously you will not be able to sleep because your body is not resting anymore and so this is the effect of this on the central nervous system and then you can see that there will be a lot of palpitation because the cardiac activity is going to be enhanced and the patients will definitely complain of palpitation 
and obviously there will be a weight loss though the patient is able to eat properly rather the appetite is very good but because of an increase in the resting basal metabolic rate. Uh, normally when, you, when we have to actually lose weight we would like to exercise and uh, lose weight because we enhance the basal metabolic rate and we enhance the muscular activity but in the presence of uh, excessive amount of thyroxine uh, even if you're not exercising this basal metabolic rate is enhanced and your muscles keep on working even if you are not actually, uh, you know, utilizing them. So there is a weight loss and uh, uh, one of the very common symptoms that since your basal metabolic rate is high, uh, you will have a feeling of heat intolerance. Naturally, when your nervous system is uh, being stimulated a lot, you're having a lack of sleep. So there will be a lot of irritability. And if you move on to the uh, commonest signs, you'll have a goiter in most of the circumstances. There'll be tachycardia, there'll be tremors because, you know, there's an enhancement of the, um, of the central nervous system. And obviously, in the later stages, you will have exceptional loss. And uh, if I start with the uh, general physical examination, you'll find that the pulse rate will be high. Most of these patients are hypertensive. They'll have a, you know, when you actually touch them, you'll have a feeling that they have got a raised body temperature. And obviously, they will be having, apart from tachycardia, they'll have, uh, you know, tachypnea because their respiratory system is also enhanced. Um, once again, I'll take a short break and uh, just uh, get a feedback. G, uh, T, the sound is all right? So uh, that is how uh, uh, the clinical features would, uh, you know, look like. But let me, because uh, since uh, you are at home and uh, you will not have much of the opportunity to come to the wards and see these patients. I'll just show you some pictures that how do actually, um, how would, uh, I, I've shown you pictures how, that how would a goiter look like and how would a diffuse toxic goiter would look like and how would a toxic modern uh, multinodal goiter look like and how would a toxic adenoma look like. So let me show you a few uh, symptoms in the hand. You can see that when you actually uh, see the hands, this, this is one of our patient, and when you see the hands of these patients, there will be a lot of sweating. You know, sweating also occurs in people who are very nervous and in anxiety. You'll have, you know, that their hands will have sweating. But in cases of nervousness and in anxiety, uh, the hands will not only be having a lot of sweating, but uh, they will be cold. In cases of thyrotoxicosis, you have a lot of sweaty hands when you shake hands with them and when you or you ask them to show their hands you'll find a lot of sweat on their hands uh, but at the same time the hands will be very warm and this warmth is depicted by you know you'll see it more clearly into this picture that there's a lot of palmar erythema so there's an enhanced uh, vascular supply into the tissues uh, because there is a lot of hyperdynamic circulation and this hyperdynamic circulation would be visible not only into the palms, but onto the soles and onto the forehead as well. So you'll have a patient who is sweating onto the palms, who's sweating onto the soles, who's also sweating onto the forehead. And then on the, on the hand, there are certain other, uh, you know, worthwhile uh, signals. And you'll find that, uh, I'll just explain you, you'll just see the pictures first. You'll find that uh, the digits in the terminal portions, they become more swollen and you'll find that the nails, they'll have ridges and the nails will actually become discolored, not on, onto the sides, but onto the fronts as well. And this is what is known as thyroid acropachy, which means, uh, you know, uh, the effect of thyroid gland on the distal portions of your uh, body, like extremities on the hands or onto the feet. So this is what you're going to find. You'll find that uh, the uh, digits, term, the terminal portion of the digits, they will actually become more broader and uh, they, and in the extensive stages, you'll find that they'll be clubbing as well. And this is because of the reason that, uh, you know, there's excessive amount of bone deposition known as periosteal new bone formation. And this is not only going to be onto the uh, metacarpals and metatarsals, but this is also going to be onto the terminal flanges as well. So, uh, it's also going to go onto the terminal flanges as well. And, you know, you, you can see that uh, the nails are also actually disfigured. This is a patient of thyrotoxicosis. Actually, the, what happens to the nails is that the nails, they actually start getting lifted from the underlying uh, 
uh, underlying base because the nails are going to get get their blood supply or not the blood supply but actually the nutrition from the base of the nail. So the nail, the base of the nail actually starts getting separated from the nail itself. So the nails get separated. So you'll find that the nails are the nails they get devoid of their blood supply, and the nails will become discolored and actually the nails they start falling. And same is true for the hair fall as well. So if you talk about the uh, varieties of the thyrotoxicosis, we have got primary thyrotoxicosis in which the central nervous system and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, um, the neurological system and your ophthalmological system, it is more involved. Whereas in thyrotox secondary thyrotoxicosis, we'll come to the secondary thyrotoxicosis in a, in a detail a bit later. But here, uh, mostly it is the cardiovascular system which is involved. And the commonest ways of presentation of the, you know, of uh, the secondary thyrotoxicosis is uh, initially you'll have sinus tachycardia because excessive thyroxine is going to lead to, uh, you know, increased heart rate. But initially this is just sinus, sinus tachycardia. If you're not going to take care of that, it will be multiple extracystis. Not taking care of that, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and then there'll be persistent atrial fibrillation. Sometimes uh, in cases when you have got a retrosternal coiter, and uh, it is toxic, uh, the patient on the surface will have no symptoms related to goiter. And the patient will present with symptoms pertaining to CVS. And for years and years, they are treated for their cardiac disease. Actually, they don't have any cardiac disease at, at all. They have got a toxic goiter which is hidden and which is not very evident. And sometimes when there's a diffuse toxic goiter and the goiter is even visible, but in short-necked individuals, and this is not very prominent. And if you're not very careful about evaluating the symptoms, the patient will become toxic. And whenever the patient is toxic, the symptoms which are produced pertaining to the cardiovascular system, they would be just like this, as if the patient is suffering from a heart disease. And you can see the sinus tachycardia, axosysles, paroxysmal electrical tachycardia, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and persistent atrial fibrillation, they're all you know, uh, features which would actually deviate the attention of any good clinician that the patient is having, uh, you know, symptoms related to the heart disease. And they keep on getting investigated for that, and they're never proven that they are, uh, you know, uh, cardiac patients. So you should remember this important technical point that sometimes the only presentation of a thyrotoxic patient is just like as he or she is having symptoms of some kind of cardiac illness. So uh, you, you must remember that. And vice versa, all those people who have got symptoms of a cardiac disease, they must be investigated for their thyroid function as well. Because it only takes one blood test to be absolutely sure that they are not, or whether they are or not suffering from a thyroid problem. Few words about the eye signs, and you must have seen while you were in third year or fourth year, in, in, in the beginning of the final year, that people will have what is known as proptosis, and when this proptosis actually enhances, this proptosis is presented in the form of exophthalmos. Normally, if you can see that uh, the uh, upper limbus of your cornea is normally covered with the, with, the, uh, with the upper eyelid. And usually, the lower eyelid also covers it up. But usually, the lower eyelid might not cover it up completely. But usually, the upper eyelid com almost covers the upper limbus of the cornea all the time, wherever your gaze is. So it, is, it keeps on covering. But, uh, what happens in uh, thyrotoxicosis, especially in the Graves disease, that uh, uh, there's a lot of initially deposition of fluid and tissue in the retrobulbar areas. Uh, there are certain uh, amino isoglycocans which are actually deposited into the retrobulbar tissue. And actually, this deposition of amino isoglycans this actually pushes the, uh, you know, the uh, the mm, eyeball forwards and apart from that there is a spasm of the levator palpebrae superioris because of the excessive activity of the sympathetic system so what happens is this that the eyelid is also pulled upwards because of the spasm of the levator palpebrae superioris and at the same time a lot of deposition of fluid and uh, you know um, um, amino isoglycocans into the retrobulbar area the eyeball is pushed forwards. So initially, it's just like, you know, there's a steady look. If you see this patient, uh, I've taken this picture from the book, you see it looks that is the patient is staring at you. 
and uh, actually it is not the stare which uh, the patient is giving to you, it is actually the spasm of the levator palpebrae superioris and the deposition of the fluid and the tissues into the retrobulbar tissues and it will. So initially it will only be, you know, uh, um, an eye sign which will give you proptosis or you'll feel that the patient is giving you a very a staring look. But as, you know, the excessive deposition uh, of um, uh, these tissues, this keeps on going on into the retrobulbar area, it starts compressing the veins. So when there is compression onto the veins, uh, there's a decrease in the venous drainage of the orbit. And you will find out that there's a lot of periorbital edema initially. And then you will start developing, uh, you know, hyperemia in the conjunctiva. And then finally, uh, there'll be a lot of chemosis where actually the conjunctiva swells because there is no venous drainage of the conjunctiva happening anymore. And the, the conjunctiva starts bulging out of the, you know, uh, eye lines. So this is an extreme form where uh, not only there is, uh, because of the congestion of the veins, there's decreased venous drainage of the eye orbit. And you'll have a lot of periorbital edema and you will have, uh, you know, the staring look which is always there. There's, there are conjunctival hemorrhages and there's a lot of conjunctival edema in which the conjunctiva starts actually, you know, I've, I've seen this kind of thing only three or four times in my life, but this actually happens. And there's a lot of, if you, the patient comes very late to you and the patient is not treated, then this is, uh, you know, going to happen. And if it is not still not treated at this time, uh, then there's a serious risk of corneal ulcerations and conjunctival ulcerations, and this might lead to blindness. But before that happens, because of the excessive uh, deposition of the tissues into the retrobulbar areas, the levator muscles of the eye, they are also, you know, start losing their function. And you can see that uh, this is the normal and there's a lot of deposition of tissues into the, uh, into the retrobulbar area, because of which actually, especially the elevators of the, uh, you know, eye, eyeball, they are so, you will have diplopia because the, the, the both eyes would not be able to converge simultaneously onto one focal point. And then finally, you will have the paralysis of the eyeball because the eyeball sort stop moving because the muscles are so much compressed. So this is the real, the, this is the real extreme form. And very rarely you will, uh, you know, reach this stage before that uh, some kind of, uh, you know, treatment should be initiated. The thyrotoxicosis should be treated. Uh, steroids should be given. Sometimes intraocular uh, steroids are also given. And sometimes the eye surgeons would go ahead and do a lot of debulking into the retrobulbar area so that the uh, proptosis actually finishes. Because if you do not stop this process, uh, this would ultimately lead to complete blindness. And uh, you'll have uh, technically the lid lag. Uh, lid lag is very easy to demonstrate. Actually, normally, when you uh, shift your gaze upwards or downwards, the lid is actually f going to follow your eyeball. So when if you take your lid up, the eyeball is also going to follow down up. And if the eyeball follows down, the lid is also going to follow the eyeball. But if you ask a patient of thyrotoxicosis to do it simultaneously, since there is a spasm of the levator palpebrae superioris, uh, you know, uh, when you take your eyes up and down rapidly, there will be time when the levator palpebrae superioris uh, palpebrae superioris gets uh, paralyzed and the lid is not going to follow the eyeball. So when the patient moves the eye downwards, you will see that the eyelid also does not come down simultaneously and this is known as a lid lag. But to, uh, you know, to, uh, to show a lid lag, that how a lid lag would occur, you will have to actually uh, repeatedly, uh, you know, take your, you know, you will have to place your finger in front of the eye of the patient and ask the patient to follow your finger up and then down and then you move it up and down rapidly and you'll see that after four or five uh, rapid movements the lid will start lagging it is not at the first time it's on the fifth or sixth movement when the eyeball moves down the lid does not actually accompany the eyeball so there is what is known as the lid lag sign and we'll talk about uh, uh, people will develop a pretty will mix mix edema but you know, a uh, few words about how to investigate thyrotoxicosis. Uh, we have talked about the investigations and the how to investigate a goiter in detail. We've talked about, uh, you know, all the investigations, but few points which are very pertinent to the investigation and for the investigation of the thyroid um, thyrotoxicosis. Uh, you know, the most reliable screening measure for thyroid function is the TSH. Because, you know, 
T3 and T4 uh, will be disturbed, but they will be disturbed in the later part of the disease. In most of the times, when you're checking the T3 and T4 levels uh, done, uh, you'll find that either they are in the upper limits of the normal in cases of thyrotoxicosis or lower limits of the normal in case of hypothyroidism. Uh, usually when T3 and T4 are beyond the upper limits, usually it is uh, the already the thyroid disease is, is very, very aggressive and very, very advanced. It's always in a very, very advanced stage. So uh, the more sensitive would be, you know, the first thing which is going to be disturbed is going to be the thyroid stimulating hormone. And when there is excessive amount of thyroid function going on into the body, the T3 and T4, the thyroid stimulating hormone levels are usually suppressed to unbearable levels. And in thyroid oxycosis, usually it is uh, less than 0.04 or 0.05 um, uh, micro international units per milliliter in thyroid oxycosis. And if you see the uh, uh, normal uh, range of this uh, um, TSH, uh, it is usually between uh, 0 0.4 to 4 uh, micro international units per milliliter. So when it's less than uh, you know, 0 0.05 or 0 0.04, this is a remarkable thyrotoxicosis. And here you can get a very fair amount of you know, diagnostic clue that you are actually suffering from uh, 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 thyrotoxicosis. Uh, you know, T3 and T4, this is the normal range of T3 and this is the normal range of T4. They're also very high, uh, but, but this enhancement is very late in the disease, you must remember. So T3 and T4, you would not find them in the beginning of thyrotoxicosis. If you want to have an early diagnosis, you have to measure the TSH levels, which will be very low. Uh, this is a late finding. And measuring T4 or free T4 and total T3 is recommended in patients with suspected thyrotoxicosis when TSH is low. So when you find out that the TSH is low and you want to have a further evidence, you can actually go ahead and do a T3 and T4 examination. And uh, patients who have got milder thyrotoxicosis, they might just have just slight elevation of T3 levels only. So the complete picture is that whenever we order, we will always order a TSH, a T3 and a T4 to, to get a complete picture. But in mostly circumstances, if you're short of money and if you want to have an early diagnosis, uh, TSH levels are the... Uh, um, are the best one to do. But apart from that, uh, uh, just few words about the autoantibody status. You must know that because uh, Graves disease, the toxic multinodular goiter, Graves disease is usually an autoimmune disorder. And this is, as I told you, that uh, uh, certain thyroid receptor, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibodies are there. And the commonest antibody which is uh, there is, it is known as anti-thyroid peroxidase antibody. This is the most specific and autoantibody test for autoimmune thyroiditis. Uh, the T-tests are usually significantly elevated in most common types of hypothyroidism. Graves disease and usually are lower absent in toxic multinodular goiter and toxic adenoma. So if you're talking about Graves thyrotoxicosis or a diffuse toxic goiter or an autoimmune thyroiditis, you are going to request for an anti TPO antibody. This is more specific because uh, this would not be raised much in toxic multinodular goiter and toxic adenomas. You must remember that because I told you that toxic adenoma is not dependent upon these thyroid stimulator hormone receptor antibodies. They are dependent upon their own independent RNA activity. And then the next uh, antibody, autoantibody, which you uh, should be, you know, sending your investigation for is the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, known as TSI levels. And they are, if these are elevated, this will also help us in the diagnosis of Graves' disease. And similarly, if you can find out the anti-thyroglobulin uh, or anti-TG antibodies, they're also present in Graves' disease. So if you want to diagnose Graves' disease, you will have to order these three autoantibodies, anti-TPO antibody, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins levels and anti-thyroid globulins or anti-TG antibodies. They are required. And if you do that, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, you have diagnosed an autoimmune uh, thyroiditis or a Graves' disease. Remember that the treatment of Graves' disease or autoimmune thyroiditis is not surgery straight away. It is not surgery. Remember, it is not surgery. It is actually a medical management first. And if it is not medically controlled, then this patient might uh, uh, get 
uh, some kind of uh, you know other treatment as well. So a few words about uh, um, thyrotoxicosis, the management of thyrotoxicosis. As I told you, that uh, it is a disease which has to be actually managed many medically. Uh, we have to start with certain antithyroid drugs, and uh, we have uh, carmimazole and propylthyroxine. Actually, I've dis discussed their mechanism of action in my previous lecture that they are enzyme inhibitors. They, they are going to inhibit the enzyme. And so when we actually, uh, we can start them on diffuse toxic goiter, toxic multinodal goiter, toxic adenoma, in all three of them, because you do not take, take these patients to the operation theater till you have controlled their toxicity. And uh, the usual is that we start with a low dose. It is usually five milligram uh, thrice daily, and then we build up to up to 30 milligrams per day. So the maximum dose is two tablets thrice daily till you know you get the TSH levels to normal. And uh, there's a definite advantage of the antithyroid drugs that uh, it helps you to actually control uh, the uh, the toxicosis because you never take these patients to the operation theater till you have controlled the thyrotoxicosis. And sometimes if you control the thyrotoxicosis, especially in cases of autoimmune thyroiditis and in cases of all the other kinds of, uh, you know, thyroiditis, you, uh, you, this might be the only treatment because you might not require surgery in them. And the, the disadvantage is that the drugs themselves, they are toxic. So they have got a lot of uh, toxicity ranging from bone marrow suppression to toxic to the liver and toxic to the brain as well. So there, there are disadvantages of antithyroid drugs as well. But the advantages are much more as compared to. So we are aware of, uh, you know, uh, people who will get, get a bone marrow suppression or a suppression of their immune system. Um, or So the moment they start developing some kind of symptoms of uh, suppression of the immune system, we stop them and we resort to other kind of drugs. And then, you know, uh, we do, do utilize beta adrenergic blockers. This is to actually stop the activity of the Thyroxin on the neuromuscular junctions and the neuroneuronal junctions. excessive because uh, the uh, the beta blockers they actually work as competitive inhibitors of thyroxine at the neuromuscular junctions. So they compete for thyroxine and they cover the uh, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor sites uh, um, and they block them. Uh, so that is the reason that the effect of thyroxine on. So this is uh, when we require an immediate stoppage of the function of excessive thyroxine on the neuromuscular junctions and the neuroneural junctions, we utilize, uh, you know, beta blockers. And we start with a low dose. Uh, we, we start with uh, 10 milligrams. And the first dose is really given in the night because they will cause a bit of postural hypotension. We tell the person of, uh, you know, a person, so you will start with 10 milligrams and enhance it. And the maximum dose you can go up to right up to 160 milligrams per day in divided doses. And you continue the beta blockers. You don't withdraw the beta blockers because remember that beta blockers, they have got a cardioprotective action. They actually enhance the uh, you know, ability of the myocardium to utilize oxygen. So if you withdraw them suddenly, the patient might have a, some kind of a cardiac problem because if the patient is already compromised as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned, uh, sudden withdrawal of the beta adrenergic blockers would cause a problem. So remember, beta blockers are now never withdrawn uh, you know, suddenly. You start from a dose of 10 milligrams then you can actually build up the dose up to 160 milligram till the you know symptomatically the patient gets better but remember the actual management is through the antithyroid drugs you have to give carb carbimazole or propyl thyroxine but this is better for the symptomatic management and uh, obviously you must not forget that when you are treating thyrotoxicosis especially in women rest sedation and sleep is a part of the management you tell the patients and you tell because in in our society women are supposed to work they are supposed to get up early in the morning they are supposed to prepare breakfast they are supposed to clean the house and prepare the you know look after the kitchen and look after the children and look after so they work a lot at their home but you have to tell their families that now you know this treatment is not going to work beta blockers are not going to work a sedation is not going to work and and your carbimazole is not going to work if you're not going to provide them with a good rest and sedation and sleep. So they would, they should be given anxiolytics, good food supplements, because they have lot of, lost a lot of weight. So they have to regain weight and they have to get the treatment done. So remember, this is, I've written this, this down so that you should not forget to counsel the patients and the families. Uh, 
पेशेंट्स को तो समझ में आ जाती है ज़्यादा जरूरत होती है उनकी फैमिलीज को काउंसिल करने के लिए दैट दे डू रिक्वायर लॉट ऑफ रेस्ट सडेशन एंड स्लीप will come down to uh, will come down to the uh, surgical aspects of the uh, management but as i told you that uh, the indications for surgery in uh, in in a goiter is cosmetic number 1 if it is having compression compressive features it is number 2 it's malignancy number 3 and toxicity is the last part remember it is a medical disease it has to be you know taken care of medically first and only few of the patients who have got toxicity especially a toxic adenoma or a toxic multinodular goiter they would require to go for uh, you know uh, surgeries so we'll continue uh, with this in the next lecture uh, we'll talk about the thyroid malignancies and then finally the thyroid surgeries thank you so where do i finish i'll let speaker aa gaya So I stop here. I stop here. G. Any question answers?